Well, welcome to um, today's uh, installment of GIS 101. Today we are looking at the very important topic of next generation 911. Uh, GIS 101 is a uh, webinar series that NISJIC has put together to present a non-technical overview of topics within GIS. Um, the series was created as a tool for NISJIC members and others to use with the many um, people we deal with who could benefit from learning more about key GIS topics. Um, the webinars are recorded and archived um, on the NISJIC website. And today we are um, excited and glad to have Michael Fashaway here with us. Michael is the uh, co-chair of NISJIC's Next Generation 911 Committee and is going to be speaking to us today about the topic of Next Generation 911, giving us some more information about what that look, looks like, um, what we are going to be looking forward to, and how we can um, work together to make the successful transition um, nationally to this important system. So with that, I will just uh, hand it over to you, Michael. Thank you, Molly. So just a quick overview of the topics today. Um, I'll get into a little brief history of 911, uh, introduce how the current 911 system works, and then get into the, the meat of the next-gen 911 and the role GIS will play in next-gen 911, as well as how it's being implemented um, in different parts of the country and uh, what different states, local governments, and PSAPs can uh, be doing to get ready and prepare for next-gen 911. And then we'll leave some time at the end to uh, answer questions and uh, discuss it further if, if need be. So uh, history of 911, uh, 911 system originated over 50 years ago. Uh, the first call was placed in Haleyville, Alabama in 1968. Um, 911 and kind of a single number uh, was kind of derived and developed because at the time uh, you actually had to call in on a regular seven digit number um, and you had to know that number. So the idea was having a single phone number to call would make it easier for anyone anywhere to be able to contact emergency services. And so at the time, Bell Telephone um, worked uh, with a number of other folks in the federal government to institute the 911 system. And by dialing 911, uh, directly connects the caller to what is called a, a public safety answering point, um, which is kind of your emergency dispatch center. Um, obviously, back then it was designed around fixed landline phones, um, and uh, so a number of uh, enhancements were made over time. First, uh, one being the automatic number identification, what we call Annie, was incorporated so that as a user dialed 911 and it was answered at a PSAP, uh, the PSAP um, telecommunicator could see the phone number um, that 911 was being dialed by. Um, this is extremely helpful in the cases where um, someone couldn't talk or um, or the phone line was disconnected, they were able to kind of call back. And, uh, and so that was a, a big enhancement. Um, later, uh, because telephone numbers are, were typically associated with some sort of place, a house, or a business, there was an address. So the system was enhanced to not only display the, the phone number, but also the address of the, the telephone number that it was being um, called from. And this was called ALI, or the Automatic Location Information Database. Um, this is also really helpful because it started to provide some sort of location um, for dispatchers to see. And then all these addresses and things were uh, validated um, by another database called the Master Street Address Guide, what we call the MSAG, which is basically just a 
table of street names and address ranges that they would plug in a subscriber's address, a telephone subscriber address, to validate whether or not it was um, in a certain area, and then that area was then linked to the correct PSAP that that call would be answered by. Uh, the system was again needed to be enhanced and modified in the early, well in the 90s and early 2000s to accommodate uh, wireless and mobile phones. Um, this was generally called E911, um, but it was still it's important to note still mostly based on the same uh, technology that had been around since 1968. So you're talking about analog, traditional telephone lines. Um, but there was a need to obviously determine where a call was coming from when it was dialed from a wireless phone because uh, you no longer had that address of the house or the business that um, the phone number was registered to. So the first step was to locate the call based on the cell tower um, that the, the phone connected to. Um, each cell tower and in some cases individual sectors of the cell tower kind of like shown in the, the graphic there, um, were designated uh, to send to a particular PSAP. Um, and this was what the FCC um, called phase one location. Uh, and as you can see, whether or not it's either the sector or a single tower, um, any call coming from a cell tower could be from a very large area. So your location is you know, very rough in, in that case. Um, after the call comes into the PSAP, um, it's answered and there's what's called a phase two location, which is um, where possible and um, if it comes in in time, the wireless carriers will send a lat long or a latitude longitude coordinate of the actual caller device. Um, but again, this is provided by the cellular service provider, and sometimes it doesn't come in or it's delayed in arriving. Um, and even when it does come in, depending on the type of device and everything, uh, the accuracy is generally within 50 to 300 meters. Um, so again, a, a pretty rough, um, rough estimate of the, the location. It's not exact. Um, as a result, often, uh, the first question that a, a 911 dispatcher would ask um, is, isn't what's your emergency, kind of like you hear often in the, the TV shows and things, but it's rather what is your location um, because they either need to confirm the location they have or um, they want to get more precise information and, and figure out exactly where you are because chances are they do not know. And all this adds up to um, a lot of uncertainty in the location and a lot of additional time um, to figure out where an emergency is happening. And in the case of 911, where often lives are on the line and everything, those uh, extra seconds to minutes can be um, really important. So this gets us into next gen 911. Uh, next generation 911 or, or NG911. Um, NG911 is a loosely defined term for the evolution of the existing 911 system. Um, we often refer to, and I'll refer to it uh, this way going forward in this talk, um, the existing 911 system is what we call legacy 911. Um, and so that's using all those uh, analog traditional telephone technologies and things like that. The benefits of Next Gen 911 are numerous and many, uh, too much to really get into on this call and this talk in particular. Um, and since this is kind of a GIS webinar, uh, I'm going to focus mostly on the location aspects and the improvements uh, to location that Next Generation 911 will bring. Uh, so, one of the primary drivers of next gen is to update 911 systems and infrastructure so calls are routed to a PSAP based on the actual uh, caller location rather than the location assigned to a telephone number or a cell tower location. Um, 
So this means the actual location of a calling device, uh, whether it's a landline um, in, in a house or a hotel or something like that, or whether it's a, a wireless device somewhere else. Uh, the system uh, will need to be entirely changed. Um, again, from kind of the reliance on analog uh, telephone technology to moving into internet protocol or what we call IP-based networks. Um, the system will also enable a whole lot more information once it's IP-based to be, to be sent and received by a PSAP. Um, this can include things like text messages and videos, um, all kinds of uh, internet of things, um, crash notifications from uh, vehicles that have things like OnStar. Uh, there's a whole host of different communications that will now be, and data that will now be available to PSAPs once they've made these, these changes and move into next gen. So, Kind of one way to to think about all this and, and look at it is to compare legacy 911 and next gen 911, um, and I'll kind of, kind of look at it that way. And we'll start with how a 911 call is made. Um, typically, and there's there's exceptions to this. So I'm going to generalize a little bit, um, but most calls today are voice only. Um, in some cases, PSAPs can receive text messages uh, right now, but that's typically through kind of secondary uh, services that aren't actually built into the actual uh, 911 system. Um, so voice calls are, are made, calls routed um, and located via uh, the telephone networks um, and again sent to a given PSAP based on those uh, MSAG and Alley database tables that I mentioned earlier, or uh, you know, based on the, the cell tower location. GIS only comes into play in legacy 911 after the call is answered at a PSAP. Um, at that point, whatever the location is, whether it's a phase one or phase two or uh, an address, um, that call can then be placed on a map. Um, and then that map can be used by the 911 telecommunicators to visualize where a caller is located to help, you know, with dispatching whatever emergency services might be necessary. In contrast, in next gen 911, it'll all be an IP network or, or network of networks, and GIS will actually be used in real time to route the calls. Um, those legacy 911 tables, the MSAG and the Alley, uh, will go away and they'll be replaced with GIS data sets that um, represent road, things like road center lines and address points to give you your civic address locations, and then emergency service boundaries and your PSAT boundaries um, to represent where a call should be routed and, and what the appropriate um, fire law enforcement and emergency medical services are available in a given area. Um, so at its most basic, that call routing becomes a GIS process of point and polygon. Um, the point being the location of the call. Uh, again, whether it's a street address um, or for wireless calls based on the latitude and longitude of the actual wireless device. Uh, that point is then intersected with the PSAP boundary, which determines which PSAP the call should be routed to, and then it can be intersected as well with emergency service boundaries to determine what you know law enforcement, whether it's the sheriff or the city police, um, whether it's the city fire department or a rural fire department, things like that. Uh, the graphic in this slide kind of uh, tries to show that, the blue dot being the location of the caller, and then the different shaded polygons are your different PSAP boundaries, and then there's also uh, building footprints and address points and road center lines there to to provide the, the location um, for a dispatcher to, to dispatch services to. So kind of the, the real thing here is this means 911, after they've gone through these changes and their next gen, will know a caller location 
to the same level of accuracy that uh, those of us with smartphones are used to seeing uh, when we pull up Google, Google Maps or use um, other services like Uber and things. Um, you actually see where you are. Uh, currently with 911, that is not the case. And the thing about GIS here is, again, it goes from something being used after the call is routed to a PSAP to being used in real time to actually determine and route that call to the correct PSAP. So given this new way that GIS will be used, it's extremely important that GIS data be complete, accurate, current, and developed to industry standards. GIS data providers need to recognize that they'll now play an extremely critical role in a next-gen 911 system. Um, PSAPs will be required to not only have up-to-date GIS data sets, but they'll need to be regularly shared with regional or statewide data sets. And PSAPs will need to coordinate with neighbors to ensure PSAPs um, that there aren't uh, gaps and overlaps or other data anomalies, anomalies being introduced into the system because, again, GIS is kind of the heart of it all. Um, this will put a lot more responsibility on uh, GIS data providers that, that do this for 911, um, but there will be some opportunities uh, for efficiencies as well. For example, um, currently if a fire district changes, that requires editing a whole bunch of different tables, including the MSAG and the alley, and then working with the telephone companies to get those integrated into the system. Uh, in NextGen 911, that same change um, can be made much more easily uh, by a GIS data provider by editing a single boundary and then sharing or what we call provisioning that update into a NextGen 911 system. Additionally, some of the data sets that are required for NextGen 911, uh, such as address points, uh, can be used in other local government uh, business functions, and those can be extremely uh, valuable for a whole host of other things that uh, local governments have to do. Um, so by creating and maintaining this data to this standard, it's not only uh, available for 911, it can be used for all these other things that kind of um, increase its uh, return on investment. So how is uh, 91, next gen 911 being implemented? Um, 911 is handled differently all across the, the US. Uh, organizations such as the National Emergency Number Association and the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, APCO, uh, are typically the ones that develop and are developing standards for next gen 911. Um, but it's typically the responsibility of 911 authorities and PSAPs to actually implement next gen 911. Um, in most places, this means it's a local government whether it's the county or a city or some district that is a combination of, you know, counties and cities. Um, it's, it's those entities, organizations that are typically responsible for 911 response and are thus kind of in charge of the 911 system. Uh, some states have a role um, to some extent in 911. Um, but it varies, and in most cases, 911 is more of a local government function, and uh, in, in many places, 911 isn't that highly coordinated at the state level. However, uh, as next-gen 911 has is, is started to kind of come about, states are recognizing that um, even though 911 is the responsibility of local governments, states and their GIS leadership can and should play a role in helping coordinate uh, the required GIS data for, for next gen at the state level. Um, the need for GIS data sets that meet next gen 911 standards and accuracy requirements can just much more efficiently be accomplished if states are part of that coordination effort. 
So as mentioned above, uh, it's being implemented differently across the country. Um, a few states have made significant progress and are actually beginning to route 911, 911 calls based on their KIS data. Uh, in other places, the implementation is occurring at regional levels um, and in many places are only beginning um, to do the planning or, or are very early in uh, the transition to next gen 911. It's uh, also important to realize that this transition to next gen isn't an all or nothing sort of thing. It's not just a, a quick flip of the switch. Um, in most places, uh, next gen functionality is will be implemented most likely in different stages, um, such as uh, the change to an all IP based network and infrastructure happening first, and then they can incorporate geospatial call routing as the GIS data um, is ready to do that. And then things, you know, some of the more advanced uh, functionality, like uh, for the ability for PSAP to, to receive a video call or get crashed notifications and things will start to, to be incorporated into, um, you know, the, what the PSAP's able to handle. Um, so this is kind of referred to as a phased approach and um, will likely vary in uh, how quickly and to what extent things are implemented jurisdiction to jurisdiction based on available resources and, you know, the prior priorities at that local level. Um, so I think that kind of sums it up. Um, if there's uh, questions, I'd be happy to, to, to answer them. Michael, thank you so much. That was a, a ton of, of great information. Um, do we have any questions on the line? I feel like you covered so much ground. Any questions? This is Karen. I have one question. Okay. What does I3 stand for? I3, um, it's kind of the, the term that Nina came up with. Um, so next gen is kind of considered the third sort of major evolution in the uh, 911 system. And so I3 is just kind of the, the designation they've given that for I3. Um, I3 sort of encompasses all of the, the concepts of what a next gen, a standards based next generation 911 system would be. So it's, you know, the geospatial call routing, the um, IP networks and a network of networks so that uh, one, one state's uh, 911 systems can all interface with another states and actually the whole countries once it's all rolled out, um, as well as all the, these other additional data repositories and things that will be available um, and, and be able to be, uh, you know, ingested by a, a PSAP when calls are made. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael, this is Jamie. Michael, Oops, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to ask um, if you can tell us, you know, I know that, that um, it's not set in stone, but do you have a, a sense of what the timeline is for implementing NG911 across the country? Yeah, so, I mean, I, as I kind of mentioned earlier, it's being implemented, you know, differently and on different time frames everywhere. Um, some places are, are pretty close to being there while others, you know, certainly aren't. Um, so there's really no defined timeline. Uh, there's efforts kind of ongoing in the industry to kind of push this. Um, telephone technologies are changing rapidly. A lot of the analog technologies being phased out by the, the service providers. Um, so there's kind of a need um, on multiple levels to to really implement this as as quickly as possible, um, but 
there's other issues like funding um, for it. It's um, it requires you know additional resources to to make the transition and everything, and that obviously has implications for local governments and things that um, don't have endless funding in coffers for this kind of stuff. So um, it's tough to say uh, what the timeline will be, um, but you know um, I've seen estimates of you know within five years or so it should be much more commonplace. Uh, through the U.S., but there will likely be, you know, um, places where it hasn't been implemented yet, and that could be ongoing for for quite a ways out. And Michael, kind of along the the same lines as the question that Molly just asked, um, you know, and I know that some states are further along than others. Do we have an understanding of like where states are specifically in doing this? You know, is, and I'm just going to like give an example, like is Virginia really, you know, far ahead in their implementation of next gen 911 versus say Ohio or, and I'm just pulling states out of a hat. Um, but is there a place where that information is available? Sure, a couple places. Um, so the National Emergency Number Association, NEMA, has a, a map on their website that kind of has a very generalized um, categorization of where states are at on this. Um, it doesn't really tell the full picture. Uh, NISJIC just went through a geospatial maturity assessment where um, next generation 911 implementation, uh, specifically kind of more on the GIS side. Um, but there was um, some information gathered from all the states on that. So uh, NISJIC's GMA has a little bit of information on that. Um, the National 911 program also uh, does a yearly um, kind of survey and report that uh, all the states and their their nine one statewide nine one one coordinators all respond to that kind of helps um, track where states are at um, and how far along they are with it. So it's kind of scattered through um, several different places, uh, but some of that information is out there. Great, thank you. Maybe one more question. <laughs> sure. Um, so, could you maybe share a bit more about what the steps or phases um, are that jurisdictions will follow during the transition to Next Gen 911? Sure. So, um, sort of again, it, it can vary a little bit um, from place to place, uh, but at a, at a very high level, the three main pieces of implementing NextGen 911 are um, the ESINet or those IP networks uh, to the GIS data and um, the eventual GIS call routing, and then three um, upgrades and things that have to happen at the PSAP level with call handling equipment and everything that will allow the PSAP to both interface and work on a as ENET and IP networks, and then take advantage and use that geospatial call routing and, and all the, the GIS side of it. Um, so those are kind of the, the three main parts. Um, the transition and preparation for all three can happen in stages, or they can occur at the same time. For example, a, you know, PSAPs could be improving and preparing their GIS data while at the same time, uh, you know, transitioning to an ESINet um, and coordinating with the different PSAPs around them, and then also uh, replacing their their call handling equipment with, uh, you know, servers and, and software that's next generation 911 compliant. So um, again, it's going to vary, uh, 
you know, which ones are tackled first and how quickly based on the different priorities and needs and resources, you know, at the local level, most likely. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, uh, there's one more slide here. It's some additional resources um, that if uh, people are interested, they can uh, follow the links. Um, it's to some of the, the kind of the big uh, organizations that I've already mentioned, like NINA, APCO, the National 911 Program, things like that, so. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much, Michael. You're welcome. Thank you.